Hello, everybody, and welcome to Politico Live. My name is Eddie Wax. I'm a reporter on the agriculture and food team here in Brussels. Um, and we've got a fantastic panel for you today. We've got some really knowledgeable and opinionated experts. And we're going to be talking about the future of agriculture in Europe, specifically in the EU, after after this pandemic. Yes, we have to wait until after after it's passed. But we're, we're talking about the future of farming and food. And um, this is the first event of our Drive Sustainability Progress series. So we can uh, expect more events of this nature later on in the year. Um, and yeah, we're, we're going to be talking about um, the future of farming and food, as I said. And because co COVID-19 has really changed the way that we've thought about food um, and the way that we've engaged with engaged with our food, even just on a, on a personal level. Um, but it's also caused real problems in the, in the policy world um, and, in the, and, in, and in the field as well. Um, this time last year, supermarkets were being raided for essentials. Um, that caused a lot of logistical problems across Europe. Um, the commission had to, had to get involved there. Uh, restaurants have been closed for months. There's been supply problems. Uh, even entire sectors such as the fur farming industry have been unexpectedly um, under intense pressure because of the, the pandemic. Um, and this has led politicians, such as most recently French President Emmanuel Macron, to, to champion farmers and send that, send that message about how important farmers are for producing our food. But I want to go further than that. I want to dig under the, dig under the surface a little bit and um, talk about the role of farmers and the changing role of farmers and what they're being expected to do um, as we try and drive towards more of a sustainable system of food production. Um, the pandemic's changed the, the debate on food security, workers' rights, um, environmental policy. So that's what I want to focus on today. I want to talk about trade, environment, the social aspect of farming and how that's changing because of the pandemic. Um, and then talk a little bit, if we have time, it's going to be a very fast-paced discussion where all our speakers are going to be doing their best to, to be succinct and precise um, on the future of food as a, final, as a final thing and how consumption patterns might change and might change especially, especially because of what we're all going through at the moment. Um, it falls to me to say that it's, uh, yes, we'd like to thank our partner, Bayer, for making this possible. Um, and all of our viewers for, for joining online. So we're very grateful that you're, that you're with us and hope that you'll stick with us. Um, this is a debate which is for you guys, um, and we hope that you get involved by um, tweeting about the event. Um, you can at Politico events. Um, you can ask questions via Slido. So that's S-L-I dot D-O. It's pretty simple. It shouldn't be too difficult. But please do make sure that you put your name in the question because there's a lot of people who've already started asking questions and they say they're anonymous, but it's much nicer. I can act like a radio host, a radio DJ, if I, if I can give you a shout out. So put your name and the company you represent or who, who you're representing. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, even LinkedIn. Um, and all your questions um, on Slido will come to me and I'll be able to ask them to our panelists in the sort of third quarter of the discussion, third or fourth quarter. Um, using that, use the hashtag, hashtag drive EU sustainability. Bit of a long one, but I'm sure you'll manage it. Um, and that's another way to ask questions as well. Um, so uh, there's also a poll, final, final thing, there's also a poll um, on Slido. And it's uh, what most needs to change in Europe's agriculture and food industry to reach the ambitions of the EU Green Deal. Um, so we'd like to hear your, your views on that. It's a multiple choice. Um, OK, now, before we get started, um, here's a word from Matthias Berninger, who's the senior vice president of public affairs um, at, at Bayer. And he'll be taking questions via Slido afterwards. I think we'll have time for one quick question afterwards. So do get those questions in and listen to him. Um, Matthias, take it away. Eddie, thank you so much, and uh, great to see you again. Thanks for hosting this event and for moderating it. Uh, I wish uh, we would be able to meet each other in person, but unfortunately, uh, the pandemic still uh, makes this quite difficult. I have to say that uh, looking back at the last year, uh, the food sector and the food systems in general have been quite resilient against the pandemic. And despite all the challenges we have, the fact that we were able to uh, ensure a secure food supply in many parts of the world uh, demonstrates uh, that farmers especially uh, are quite entrepreneurial and uh, really resilient against uh, large challenges. My hope is that that will be also true for the sustainability challenges we talk about today. The challenge with climate change clearly is that 
farmers on the one hand and farms in general and food systems in a broader sense contribute to climate change. Roughly 20% of all emissions are attributed to the sector. It's a sector that's not much talked about. Usually we talk about transportation or energy when climate change becomes a topic, but also in the area of water with more than 70% of all available fresh water being used in agriculture, we see how this system plays a very important role uh, in addressing global sustainability challenges. Uh, one of the um, asks, if you will, uh, I have when I look at the European debate is that we really take a global perspective on this topic. Um, I think that the good news of the pandemic is that sustainability has not lost steam as being a global topic, but if at all gained momentum. Um, I'm uh, joining you from Washington, D.C. today, and in Washington, D.C., you can see that under the Biden administration, decarbonization is very high on the agenda, and the U.S. agricultural sector plays a role in that as well. Um, I also think that the announcements in China, in Japan, or in uh, South Korea to decarbonize by mid of the century um, really uh, give a lot of hope for everybody that we will be much more globally coordinated in, in what we are doing. Uh, when it comes to the European debate, one of the key challenges we have uh, is to really understand the targets. Uh, for example, in the area of crop protection, a reduction of crop protection um, is something that I believe has been agreed uh, by a broad majority, a broad coalition in Europe. But what's still unclear is um, what the method of reduction would be. Is it a reduction by volume? Is it a reduction that looks at environmental impact? Is it a reduction that looks at totally different criteria? This is a very important discussion because depending on the targets we are setting, we will have much different consequences for farmers and for the agricultural sector and food systems in general. Another example is um, uh, the, the topic of digital, uh, digital agriculture. If I compare, uh, digital agriculture in Europe to what's going on in Southeast Asia or even more so in the United States, we are clearly behind. What can we do to accelerate the introduction of digital tools? Because we all know that they will help contributing to reducing uh, the environmental impact of farms and will make farms not only more efficient, but also more effective. The third example is how can we reward farmers um, when they remove carbon from the atmosphere. So how can farming techniques that really help removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere be included in the EU Green New Deal? Again, lots of questions out there. And if I compare the debate about a carbon bank in the United States to what's going on in Brussels, I can see the same debates, but not necessarily um, the same tools uh, for farmers being at hand. Generally speaking, I believe that um, we also need a debate about how open uh, we are to innovation. Because if we want to have sustainable intensification, which means we want to both address the environmental challenges, but also ensure that European farms have a, a, a great output and can deliver against both European and global market needs, we need to talk about the kind of innovation uh, they need to intensify uh, their farming. For me, in the area of plant breeding, technologies like, like CRISPR play a very important role. They are widely accepted around the world, as we can see with skyrocketing uh, patterns. The question is, will Europe adopt those technologies as well? These are a few questions uh, that we have at, at Bayer, and where we want guidance, where we also are, of course, not shy to participate in the debate. I'm very optimistic that the agricultural sector will play a positive role in forest protection, in removing carbon out of the atmosphere, and in innovating. And that is because um, what I said at the beginning, at the outset, farms and farmers have demonstrated that they can adapt to new conditions. However, they need clarity, and so do we as a company that tries to support uh, uh, those, uh, those stakeholders in addressing societal needs. So. With that being said, I really look forward to the discussion. And again, Eddie, thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you have time for a quick question. We have someone called sure. S. Brem. 
Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, unfortunately, but thanks for including it. How can we face the climate crisis if we continue exploiting the planet? And what is Bayer really saying about the pesticide reduction? Uh, I think that means the pesticide reduction targets um, in the farm to fork strategy, because obviously they do um, target your industry specifically very strongly, asking for a 20, asking for a 50% reduction by 2030 in the risk and use of pesticides. Well, first of all, I believe we need to stop deforestation around the world, which starts in Europe, where unfortunately forests are not in good conditions, but of course doesn't end in places like Latin America. So I believe that uh, net uh, uh, zero deforestation is one of the key things everybody needs to agree to. And on the pesticide side, uh, we, we spend roughly a billion every year in doing research and development for new pesticides. So in other words, our answer to the challenges with the current set of pesticides is to come up with innovation. We don't need to rely on a set of pesticides that has been developed in the 1950s or 1960s. Uh, there is room for innovation. And that's actually how we try to approach the challenge of pesticide reduction. In order to be sure that we innovate in the right direction, full clarity on the targets is really helpful for us. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let's quickly move on to the panel discussion. And I want to introduce our panelists. Um, we have four panelists and an interesting format where we're going to bring in our fifth panelist a little bit later into the discussion um, as kind of a bit of a grenade to the debate, we hope, um, in the nicest possible way. Um, let me start off by introducing uh, Faustine Bad de Fossé, uh, the principal policy analyst and the head of agriculture and, land and the land management program at the IEEP, it's, that's the Institute for European Environmental Policy. So welcome, Faustine. Uh, we also have Umberto Delgado. Rosa, um, who is the Director of Natural Capital at the European Commission's DG Environment. Uh, so welcome. Uh, we have Paolo de Castro, an MEP from, from Italy, um, from the Socialist and Democrat um, group in the Parliament. Uh, and um, Paolo is also a former Italian agriculture minister. Thanks for joining us. And we also have Jonathan Brooks, uh, who's the Head of uh, Agriculture and Resource Policies um, at the at the uh, OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. So thank you very much, jo Jonathan. Um, I'm not sure if any, anyone, if we can see Sean Finan on the screen, but Sean Finan from the European Council of Young Farmers, who's from Ireland, will be joining us a, a little bit later on. So um, let's crack on. And um, I think one of the biggest lessons that that we've seen being talked about, at least from the from the pandemic, um, is the risk to food security that was definitely on people's minds at, at the beginning when supermarkets were sort of being raided and there was a lot of um, stockpiling going on. Uh, and this certainly seems to be something that the European Commission uh, for Agriculture, Janis Wojciechowski, uh, has been talking about a lot. He's been saying that, you know, even though there wasn't a severe threat to food security, we need to use this opportunity to diversify production and build much shorter supply chains in Europe. Um, so in our first part of the conversation, which is all, all about trade, I want to turn to you, Jonathan, from the OECD, firstly, to, to ask you whether you think this is the right sort of lesson to be drawing from the pandemic. Well, I, uh, I think if you if you look at the back at the pandemic, we saw what was possibly the biggest uh, shock and dislocation imaginable. Really, uh, there was a, a major shift from uh, consumers going out buying, uh, eating outside from the home, buying uh, uh, at restaurants from takeaway, all shifted towards the supermarkets. And what we saw there was, in a way, I think the remarkable resilience of modern supply and distribution in getting food to consumers. Uh, I know there were specific problems, but in view of the scale of the shock, the resilience really was quite remarkable. I think if you look at where the problems were, the problems were much more on the demand side than they were on the supply side, with a number of people whose incomes collapsed and their very ability to buy food was affected, and we saw increased recourse to food banks was, was a real problem. Uh, I don't think that the solution of short supply chains can be viewed as some kind of panacea. Uh, I think a lot of that is, is, is uh, thinking in the wrong way about the way that uh, the markets are working. In fact, I would say that what we saw was the importance of supply and distribution and also the importance of trade. And I strongly believe that trade will become more important uh, in future, not less important, uh, not least because the areas where supply in the world can be increased sustainably, 
are not the same as the areas experiencing population and demand growth. Uh, and also we need uh, increased yields because if we don't get increased yields and productive agriculture, then the only alternative way to increase production is from increasing area, increase, increasing land use. So actually we need supply and distribution for sustainability. Um, I just want to go back to a little bit of the of the Commission's narrative, the Commission's um, you know communications on this, because Yanis Wojciechowski, in pretty much you know in almost every appearance he's he's had so far, has talked about the importance of short supply chains. So I think it's interesting, Jonathan, that you're that you're questioning that. But to our representative of the European Commission here, I know Umberto, you're not from DG Agriculture, but you're from DG Environment. But nevertheless, why why is the Commission therefore, if the real lesson, as Jonathan is saying, is not that um, there was a supply problem, it was more of a logistical matter. Why is the Commission in the Farm to Fork strategy developing a contingency plan to constantly monitor threats to food security? Isn't that going a bit overboard to create a food crisis response mechanism and a permanent forum to discuss food security threats? Uh, hello, thanks for having me. Uh, let's say the Farm to Fork strategy does address food security, but I would say that's only uh, a part of it. The main issue on the farm to fork strategy, and by the way, also in the biodiversity strategy, that is its sister sharing some common targets, is to ensure that the food system gets sustainable because it's not sustainable at all. And actually the COVID crisis with all the challenges it, it brought, uh, and as we've heard, has also demonstrated a very considerable resilience of the food supply chain uh, within the EU. So I also agree that short supply chains are no panacea, yet they can have a role to play. We all have seen during the pandemics how reliant we are on nature, how, how dependent of it we are, and how we can suffer from the nature invoices that can knock at our door, including uh, the pandemics, but also extreme weather events and the effects of uh, loss of pollinators and uh, pollination and other ecosystem services. So I think the Farm to Fox tries to write uh, orientation. Uh, it was already there before the pandemics. It's all only got more needed and more uh, to the point with the pandemics, with all this, and I also agree with that, the increased attention to, uh, to sustainability that will be everywhere. And indeed, nowadays, when you find an environmental problem, if you scratch the surface, you'll often find a food link, not only from the angle of production, for sure, there's the whole food chain, but also related to the production side. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Umberto. Um, Paolo, can I bring you in here as a, as a you know, um, a member of the Agri Committee and former chair of the Agri Committee for many years? Um, you're very well placed to tell us whether this, whether this supply chains narrative, this idea of diversifying production, is that something? What, what are MEPs actually, actually working on here? You're, you've been part of the CAP discussions. You've been part of um, putting strings on the recovery funds and how, you know, what conditions farmers should get the recovery funds um, for. I mean, are we really moving towards um, a shorter supply chain system with more diverse production in Europe, or is that just a, something which is nice to talk about on panel discussions? Well, this is what we are trying to do. Of course, it's not an easy target. Um, of course, we need to fight against climate change, no question about. We need to, to give an answer to the big problem we have in front of us. But the trade-off we have, how to get there and not lose farmers on the way. So um, I uh, very much am in favor of what uh, uh, Jonathan said before. Trade implication is important. Uh, for example, the good news today is the stop of tariff between European Union and United States. Um, but how we can increase the sustainability of our production? This is the way that we are trying to do with the uh, uh, with the farm to fork. Uh, we would like to, to reduce the use of chemistry, no question at all. We should do 50%, 30%, of course, this is goal, but we need to do that. And the answer to do, the answer to get there is innovation. Innovation, we don't have to scare about the innovation. I think this is the answer to the problem we have. For example, we can, we can use more technology in genetics that can uh, uh, fight against disease instead of chemistry. 
We can use better practices like um, precision farming, smart farming, so we can limit the use of chemistry only in the portion of land where we really need. So there are a lot of perspective, but the main question is, we want to reach this result with our farmers. We don't want to lose our farmers. And we want to increase the European production. No, we don't want to reduce the European production. Otherwise, uh, the risk is that we can increase the import from other country in the world, the food import, which can have less attention to the quality standard, less attention to the environment. So uh, it's not easy target, but this is the way where we have to follow. And no question about that. Step by step, I think we are going in the right direction. If I look some figures, we are reducing in some country, like my country, for example, we are reducing the use of uh, pesticide or fertilizer, but we need to give alternative to farmers. We don't want to do against the farmers. We want to go with the farmers. This is the important target uh, uh, I think we, 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 we need to. And in agriculture committee, we are trying now to introduce as much as we can in the common agricultural policy. I know that will be not enough, but we need to wait the new legislative proposal from farm to fork by the commission. So how our goal is to maintain this trade-off, environmentally, economic, and social. This is the three points that we have to maintain together. And I very much hope that this target is good. Yes, please. I, I want to because we're talking. You, you've that's a, that's a fantastic capsule of, of your of your position. Um, but I want us to bring us back more specifically to trade, and I, I want to bring Faustine in here. I mean, do you, Faustine? Um, when it comes to short supply chains, I, I, this would just be this would just be the last uh, the last point on this. But I want to ask you the similar question that I put before. You know. Uh, is the work that Paolo is doing in, in the European um, Parliament, is the work that Umberto is, is, is part of in the Commission, is that really changing the game and creating a, um, creating a food system in Europe which is, which is focused on more, on more shorter supply chains, or, or is that not really happening? Well, thank you, Eddie. Well, first of all, I just wanted to say that it's a good thing that Women's Day was yesterday and not today, because I do feel a bit lonely uh, in the panel as the only uh, woman here, but I'll try my best, I'll try my best to uh, bring a certain sort of balance here. Um, yeah, about short supply chains and, 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 and the different solutions, etc. I mean, what I would like to, to, to go back to here is, is actually food security, because I mean, it's not just about quantity. Uh, it has been stressed a lot here, but uh, it's about producing, uh, because actually we produce enough food uh, uh, to feed the world right now. The real issues are food waste, access to food, healthy diets, uh, and food production capacity on the long term, because as we know, farming relies on uh, healthy natural resources. There is no farming if there is no healthy natural resources. Now, when it comes to trade, the problem is that very often we see that we dissociate trade from uh, uh, environmental policy in Europe, and hopefully with the Farm to Fork and the Green Deal, we'll bring everything together more coherently. Because eventually, production and consumption goes hand in hand. If I give you an example here, for instance, if we reduce our livestock production, as we should do according to uh, well, our climate uh, 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 change uh, priorities, and also uh, to strike more towards a healthy diet, then it doesn't work if consumers start consuming from abroad, obviously. But the same goes the other way around in Europe. If we start consuming at less animal production, well, actually, we keep producing at the same level and we ship everything outside of Europe, it doesn't work either. So we really need to bring uh, uh, everything more coherently. And the trade discussion uh, goes hand in hand with the environmental one and, uh, and the social uh, economic ones. Okay, so talking about the, the combination of environment and trade and, and what you were just mentioning there, Faustine, um, and we do appreciate you, you being on the panel, by the way. Um, the, um, Umberto, why is the Commission pushing so strongly for the Mercosur trade deal? Which many people well, will say uh, is going to uh, bring, you know, is, is going to lead to deforestation. Increased deforestation. Um, Go ahead. Let me say first, trade is not a goal in itself. Sustainability is an, a goal in itself. So trade is good as far it, as it helps towards its uh, bigger objective. Um, the Mercosur faces many criticisms. We are aware of it. But what we need to compare is a world without Mercosur versus a world with Mercosur, which does bring in some obligations for those involved. 
Could that be more mighty, biting? Maybe we can discuss that. But uh, the Mercosur is not at all the only approach the Commission is foreseeing on tackling, avoiding deforestation from imports. We have announced that we will come with measures, not excluding legal measures, to ensure that our imports um, don't bring in uh, forest degradation and deforestation. Actually, I think the, the Green Deal has made clear that the uh, European Union aims to have the same criteria for the, uh, uh, the imports that reach its market, that it supplies internally in compliance with WTO rules. So this is to say that I think um, Europeans do look into food, or many do, as something or on which they aim to find more naturalness, whatever that means. And that's why this move towards getting not just more production, but, but more quality of what we consume is, uh, is very much important. And on this issue of increasing productivity in Europe, let's not forget we do have nowadays a big food surplus. That's why we export so much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Faustine, can I just go back to you quickly for a, for a, for a comment on, on what you heard there? Do you, do you buy that argument that, that, you know, that ultimately Mercosur will be, a good, uh, will be a good thing for Europe because it will bind uh, South, Southern American countries like Brazil to, to stronger sort of deforestation targets and, and things like that? Well, to be discussed, I mean, that's also the, dis I mean, I think there, it's also worth mentioning the whole discussion around uh, uh, CBAM right now, etc. But uh, I like what Umberto was saying, that the trade is not a goal in itself, and uh, eventually uh, the ultimate goal uh, of tomorrow is sustainability. So mm -hmm. we need to make sure that uh, uh, whatever we do with trade, you know, is coherent with that ultimate goal. So we've we've heard some some arguments about about food security and, and we've talked about that and how how the pandemic itself you know may or may not have really uh, made an, made an impact on that. Um, but let's turn more to the EU policy uh, policy side and I think pretty much everyone watching should hopefully know that the that the farm to fork strategy is the food and farming plank of the of the Green Deal, which is the sort of flagship um, proposal from the from the European Commission. Um, so if so, if, if COVID doesn't um, you know pose a, pose a serious threat to to food production, and we're even talking about you know the need to increase food production, which is a controversial point in itself, does the farm to fork strategy with its with its targets that we were mentioning when we spoke to Bayer earlier on, um, does does that uh, pose a pose a problem for for food security in Europe, Umberto? No, I actually it poses a solution for food security. Food security is again not only quantity. And something we know is the current trend of food, be it production, distribution, retailing, and consumption is absolutely unsustainable. We know that also in very particularly for the really bad state of biodiversity in farmland, for instance. So when the food, the farm to fork uh, strategy comes in and also the biodiversity strategy, in my view, that is to ensure the full breadth of security of food production in the EU now and in the future. Okay, but Paolo, do you, do you have are you do you have doubts about that? Are you worried about the impact that, um, for example, um, targets on the reducing fertilizer, reducing antimicrobials in for you know to keep animals well and reducing pesticides? Do you think that will make farmers less productive? No, it depends how we will do it. If we will give to uh, farmers the concrete alternative to produce uh, with less uh, input of chemistry or pesticide or whatever, but giving them alternatives so they can continue to produce in a much more sustainable way, that would be great. And this is why we asking for an impact analysis. Because when we fix the target, which everybody likes, because Nobody, everybody wants to reduce uh, uh, the, 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 the impact of, uh, uh, of chemistry or other, you know. But the problem is how, how. So it's very important to give concrete alternative to our farmers. Genetic is one of the solution. We can come back with genetic, with new breeding techniques or other techniques, not OGM, but instead to, to, to give the answer. We can use it. Uh, a lot of great new technology uh, for irrigation, for example, of good practice, but we need a time for farmers to implement it. If we, we be able to implement, we can maintain the European production and we give the answer 
to what the consumer and what the people, what our society needs. Okay. Okay, um, let's go. Let I want to broaden this out though, because you know the farm to fork strategy we've heard from Paolo is something. It, it, it's there's still a lot that remains to be. You know, it's, it's not a single thing. It's it's many many actions that the Commission has proposed and legislative proposals for for those different actions, whether it's the targets or carbon farming or lots of other initiatives. They will be coming in in the in the next few years. Um, so that's important to bear in mind. But what's also an interesting element of the farm to fork strategy is the sort of global ambition of the European Commission, because almost I think it's fair to paraphrase the Commission's point of view as there's no point in us just doing all this alone if, if we don't raise up the standards ar around around the world. And this is where I want to hear from the OECD. I mean, how w w during the Trump administration, I mean, the, uh, the Amer American politicians didn't stop bashing Europe for trying to impose these pesticide targets and saying that it was going to cause a trade, you know, tr trade war between between America and the, and the EU. But how likely or how realistic do you think this attempt to woo the rest of the world and, and, and bring up their standards in line with the farm to fork strategy will really be? And what should the commission, you know, how should the commission be tackling this, Jonathan? Well, I think the, the farm to fork act, uh, strategy is truly a, a great opportunity for a paradigm shift. And, uh, and as Umberto Paolo, Paolo have pointed out, it, it really does set out uh, some very important objectives, uh, although the question, of course, will be about how policies are constructed to deliver on those, on those objectives. The basic difficulty, though, at the moment is that policy as constructed now effectively has one foot on the, on the gas and one foot on the brake. So across the EU, including expenditures by member states, there's about 80 billion per year that is spent on supporting the agriculture sector. And still about a quarter of that is spent on ways that contribute to resource pressures, either by increasing, providing incentives to increase output or by pr providing incentives to increase input use. Um, that's a similar amount that's spent on agri-environmental schemes. So those are, in a way, from a sustainability point of view, working against each other. And the real challenge is to make sure that those agri-environmental programs, it's not just the money that needs to be uh, allocated more in favour of that and away from these distorting uh, forms of support, it's also that the construction of those programs really needs to improve to be performance-based rather than practice-based. And that's actually something that is committed to in the Farm to Fork strategy, and that's something uh, to, be, uh, to be applauded. I'd also add that of the money that's spent, um, Paolo made the point and Umberto uh, made, made the point and Fastino, Fastine did as well about uh, innovation, the importance of sustainability, and sustainable productivity growth. And at the moment of that expenditure of 80 billion, there's only 7 billion is actually spent on innovation. And innovation is going to be the key to food security. It's going to be the key to providing livelihoods for farmers and providing them with viable opportunities. But it's also absolutely critical to resource use and to meeting climate change targets. Okay. So commitments are all there in terms of objectives. The question now is to shift the instrument choice in favour of pursuing those objectives sufficiently. Okay, everyone keeps mentioning innovation, and and you know I, I don't want to get too sucked towards that because that was what I was trying to keep that to the end. But I, I think it's worth a word of warning that some techniques that um, this is just as my role as an impartial moderator here. Some people do argue that that techniques like gene editing will 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 bring their own set of problems. Um, we heard the word panacea used before, so I think that's just worth um, put, putting in there. But I don't want to bring anyone else on, in on that for the time being. You talked about distorting subsidies, Jonathan, um, and so I think it's it's time to move towards the common agriculture cultural policy. Faustine, um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to turn to you because you published something in October from the IEEP um, where you said that the Commission, sorry, that, where you said that the Council, we don't have anyone representing the Council here, but, we, but you did say that the Council and the Parliament had failed your tests on, um, on, may, on keeping alive the environmental ambition of the common agricultural policy, which I think, as we all know, is, is undergoing a major reform at the moment, the first since 2013. You said that the Parliament had failed your, your tests. Um, and Paolo was part of those, a part of making that decision. Paolo's group, the Socialists, signed a deal with, the, with Renew Europe and with the European People's Party, um, which is what drove through that, that, their position in the Parliament. So 
I'm going to go to Faustine first and then to Paolo. Faustine, why do you think Paolo failed in his, uh, in his quest to keep the green ambition alive in the cap? Well, first of all, I think it's important to remind ourselves the scales of the challenges we're faced with um, and the narrow window of opportunity we have left to act. Um, I mean, it was said uh, at the beginning that uh, agriculture is, is responsible for over 10% of greenhouse gas emissions and nearly 70% of those come from the animal sector. Year after year, we keep breaking uh, uh, climate change records, which is extremely alarming. In January 2020, the World Economic Forum classified the, lo the loss of biodiversity and collapse of ecosystems as one of the top five threats facing the world in both likelihood and impact. And in Europe, we've seen uh, birds, uh, farmland birds and grass butterflies declining since the 90s by over a third. And uh, last year in 2020, the State of the Environment report reminded us that at that time we had 10 years left to bring necessary changes and radical actions. Actually today, because we're in 2021, we only have nine years left. Um, the Green Deal, and in particular the Farm to Fork strategy and the biodiversity strategy, are sending the right signals and really, you know, setting, uh, 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 let's say, us in the right direction to make the food and farming system more sustainable. At the same time, we're having uh, uh, the revision of the common agricultural policy. The big worry that I have here is that, uh, as, as it is being discussed now, it provides little, if any, requirements uh, to the member states to make it happen through the national cap strategic plans, the, the objectives of the farm to fork strategy and the, and the biodiversity one. And even more worrying, it is that the co-legislators have not jumped on that opportunity to strengthen the link, but they are doing it, actually they are doing the opposite somewhat through their amendments on conditionality uh, and, uh, and on the eco scheme. And I must add here that as someone who has been around the last reform uh, back in 20, uh, uh, well, 2010 and uh, implemented as of 2014, I have that very unpleasant feeling of bis repetita, I must say. Uh, which is even more unpleasant given the state of the challenges I just highlighted at the beginning, the urgency uh, to act and the evidence which really showed that some of the decisions were, that were made around the greening last time around did not work and uh, were set to fail. Okay. Um, you've, you've, yeah. Paolo, would you, like to, would you like to respond to that? I mean, the, the accusation no, is... I, mean, I, 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 well. I stay on the same line of Austin. The question is, uh, remember, we are uh, reforming common agricultural policy coming from the proposal of uh, uh, Phil Organ Commissioner in 2018. That is the proposal we have on the table. We don't have to forget that. We don't have on the table other proposals. Because as you know, the parliament can modify the proposal. We are not uh, uh, in, in power to introduce a new proposal. The, pro the proposal is in the end of the commission. And the commission give us in 2018 the organ proposal. And we are doing a lot to implement it, to increase the environmentally ambitious of this proposal very much. If you compare the organ proposal in 2018 and the parliament vision approved in October, is a tremendous more ambitious. Of course, my really group true? want what to about, do more. What about your, your counting areas? You're counting areas of natural in the parliament's position. You want to count areas of natural constraint, payments which go to ANCs, you know, mountainous yeah. regions, as 40% of them are green. How is how is that a move forward? But we, we, as you know, in the parliament proposal, we have a 30% of the eco scheme. 35% in the agro-environmental initiative in the rural development. So we have a lot of ambitions. I would like to know if the council will accept the parliament point of view. So we are on the track. Of course, we decide to introduce a mid-term review after two years of this pact, of this common agricultural policy, so we can introduce the news coming from the farm to fork and biodiversity strategy when this strategy will be legislative. But there is no legal link. There's no legal link between the Green Deal and, and, and the Common Agricultural Policy. I'm going to turn to Umberto now. Yes. Umberto, the, the Commission is, is negotiating as part of these trilogue negotiations, that's the word that's used in Brussels, um, with, with the Parliament and with the Council as well. I mean, the Commission's given its proposal in 2018, so 
re really, are you are you feeling powerless now? I mean, the, the the ultimate thing you could do is to remove the proposal if you really think it has been watered down in terms of its um, environmental ambition, and that's something which has been touted um, very cautiously by Franz Timmermans. But you know, what what are your red lines in the Commission now, or are you just going to sit back and let the Parliament and the Council decide everything for themselves? Well, you know, when the Gringle kicked in and the Farm to Fork, one of the first questions we posed ourselves, of course, was how far the CAP proposal would match this new uh, political environment. And together with Farm to Fork, we came out with a staff working document where the reply uh, to this question was the CAP proposal is fit for purpose towards the Green Deal and Farm to Fork provided the ambition of the proposal set by the Commission would not be diminished and would even be improved. Now, of course, when we look to the process now in the hands of co-legislators, there are many risks in the details. There are many good proposals and there are many proposals that would actually amount to reduce the ambition. So the negotiation give process example. is give us, give us an example, uh, Umberto. Give us an example of a proposal from the Council or the Parliament which you are not happy with, please. Well, you referred to one, counting areas of natural constraints as uh, necessarily environmental, which is, uh, is basically a support to income. That does reduce the amount available for agri-environmental schemes, for instance. We also have concerns on some proposals on the role of the Commission versus the approval of, of the Member States and, uh, uh, CAP strategic plans, or the role of climate and environmental authorities in the co-design of CAP strategic plans and so forth. So there are some that do pose uh, risks, some also that would diminish the uh, ambition on the eco-conditionality, on this enhanced conditionality. Uh, but as I say, um, everything is still open and we do count on the negotiation process to deliver a sound proposal that's fit for the farm to fork and the green deal. But if you, but if you don't, but if you're not happy at the end of the process, then what? I can't reply to that. I'm not negotiating myself for the commission. I just can tell you that the commission is very adamant and vigilant on getting a good cap proposal. Okay. Uh, okay. I need to uh, bring in, and I want to bring in uh, Sean at at this point. Remember, so I... remember, the, the college is labor is the council. And the parliament, please don't forget that. Eh? Okay, we, <laughs> the won't forget that. we won't forget that. The commission has to work to simplify and to help parliament and council to take a decision. Okay, okay, understood. But let me let me now go to um, go to Ireland. Um, we had a mention of Phil Hogan before, so this is not the first Irishman that's been mentioned in the in the discussion. Um, from the European, the vice president of the of CJA, so that's the European Council of Young Farmers, Sean Fine, and welcome. Um, would you? Thanks, I mean, is there anything you want to pick up on that, that you've heard so far, whether it's about trade, cap, the farm to fork strategy? Uh, I want to give you, you know, an opportunity to kind of just react to what you want. Yeah. Um I think it's, it's been a very interesting discussion um, and I would like to pick up on, on some of the points raised. Um, I think the word sustainability has been used a lot, but obviously as a farmer, um, it's very, very important to emphasize that true sustainability is economic, environmental and social. And we cannot forget about uh, the economic uh, while environmental is very, very important. And as farmers, we're very conscious of it from a, from a, from a farming practice perspective, uh, economic is, is crucial uh, to ensure that we can sustain um, our existence on the land as farmers. Um, in terms of the um, discussions around the policy areas and the farm to fork strategy, I think it's very important to have a strategy, but I do believe the role of the farmer needs to be center of that strategy. Um, for what we have seen to date, the farmer hasn't been at the centre of the strategy in its development or indeed in the, in the course of the discussions which have taken place. Um, farmers are taking all the responsibility. There is no responsibility on the consumer. There is no responsibility on the wholesaler. There's no responsibility on the retailer. And there's no responsibility on the processors. We as farmers have to take all the responsibility in terms of and we don't disagree with the reduction in pesticide use and re reduction in fertilizer use and some of the targets which are there. But at the same time, we need to have meaningful engagement and the farmer has to be centered to that. Um, the other point I would like to make is that <clears throat> there is linking and in, in, indeed and going back to the cap, we're facing a reduction in our budget in terms of the cap budget. Conditionality is increasing. So farmers ex are expected to do more 
with less. Um, and then at the same time, um, we have the EU pushing on with the Mercosur um, trade uh, agreement, um, which will have a massive impact on particular farm sectors within the EU, uh, with products coming into the EU from with a questionable environmental and sustainable footprint. So how do we square the, that and how do we balance that up? And I think um, uh, particularly uh, Humberto mentioned about uh, the need for quality and the same criteria for imports. But how is the EU going to ensure the standards are, are, are the same and that they are monitored? Um, I don't have the confidence to say that that, that will happen um, as a farmer. Um, in terms of uh, Paolo, I agree in terms of the need for innovation, but who's going to pay for that innovation? Mm -hmm. Innovation requires investment. Who's going to pay for it? Is, is, are we going to be paid for it through various um, supports and grants? Are our farmers going to be expected to pay for that investment? Because quite frankly, the money isn't, a, isn't at a farm gate level in order to pay for that innovation. I, I, and I don't dispute that innovation isn't required. It is required. But that's a fundamental question. Right. Um, in terms, in terms Thanks, Sean. Go, go, go on. One final point, and then, we'll, and, then we'll, and then we'll put some of these questions in, to the panel. In terms of... Um, in, in terms of um, just, just so to, I, I haven't the time obviously to pick up on all the points made by the speakers, but the one final point um, I'd really like to make is that um, really we need to ensure uh, that, that sustainability and to conclude with what I opened on, uh, that economic is very, very important, environmental is, is core. And I think as farmers, we do see ourselves as the new environmentalists as young farmers, but at the, we have to um, ensure that our livelihoods are, uh, are, are maintained, our incomes increase um, to ensure to be able to deliver on the ambitious targets which are being set out. Um, and also with regard to some of the targets, a carte blanche target across the board sometimes doesn't work. Certain mm -hmm. member states have particular um, uh, strengths in certain areas um, and they should be utilised and focused on. And one, one final point on the whole that final, drive final towards point. organics. Um, I think organics is, is, is going to play an important role, but we have to ensure that we don't end up commoditizing the organic sector and our consumers willing to pay the extra costs associated with production okay. and lower product productivity. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Sorry for rushing you along there. That you've you've responded to a lot of a lot of points, and you've made us, you know, reflect on the the food chain as a whole and the economic dimension, which I don't think we'd necessarily spoken about um, in so much detail so far. But what? Okay, so people have said, and everyone's pretty much said that sustainability is environmental. It's it's about it's about economics, but it's also about so the social side. So let's talk about that social side now. I mean, one of the things that we saw in the in the pandemic was uh, abattoir workers in Germany con contracting coronavirus en masse. We saw shortage of seasonal workers, these uh, people from sort of eastern and, and southern countries that often come to help on, 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 on in fields in, in Western Europe, um, but aren't really written much about or spoken much about in, in, in the press, suddenly they weren't able to travel and we, we some of these invisible farm workers were, were, were getting headlines for, for the first time. So it's changed the way that we've been thinking about the way that our food is, our food is produced. And an interesting proposal um, has come from your group, Paolo, on social conditionality, um, which in a nutshell is, is, is asking for farmers who don't comply with the labour standards and, and social laws um, to be prevented from getting access to money from Brussels um, if they fall foul of those standards. Um, why do you think that's so? Ne do you think that's really necessary? You know, specifically based on um, what we've seen in COVID. Yes, for my group, this is one of the main points. You know, because this is not the first time. We need to remember everybody that uh, the social conditionality we try to introduce in the, during the Franz Fischler time. So uh, I I think we we very much need to introduce. Uh, 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 you know. To be very clear, the, the, the cap support has to go to the farmers who respect the labor and to respect the rules. This is nothing different. I mean, if we have to respect the veterinary standards for our animal, uh, it, it's incredible that we don't have a social conditionality still today in the planet. Of course, in a very easy way. We don't want to make any bureaucracy. We are thinking something exposed, you know, like a control in the farmers have to respect the rules 
and then of course somebody have to control but i i i think this should be one of the clear point the clear message because we have to put together environmental social uh, uh, and economic sustainability i think and, this is the secret yeah. to to have a good cap in the future okay Quick final thing before I move to the Q&A, because we've got some really good questions that, that have come in. Um, to, just one thing to Paolo, where there's talk of this super trilogue to be chaired by Portugal um, at the end of this month. Um, two, two quick questions, yeah. Is, is this social conditionality um, proposal from you, is that a red line for you in, the, in these CAP trilogues? And also, are you specifically talking about this in terms of the migrant crisis in, in Italy, in terms of seasonal workers being treated so terribly in Italy, which, is, which has been written about in, in the press? Is that, can you tell us a little bit about that, whether that's feeding into your thinking? Oh, can I hear you? I don't think we can hear you. Uh, uh, sorry, 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 go sorry, ahead, sorry, go ahead. I, I, as you know, you have, we have a, in my country we have a specific law on that, uh, you know, against caporalato, no, which is uh, one of the um, incredible bad things we we saw. Not everybody, of course, but in some area of my country, in particular, using the um, uh, migrants. So, of course, the sensitive on this issue is very high. But I, I believe that this is for all Europe an important task, social conditionality. And this is why I, I think this is a great opportunity to make a step ahead. Uh, I, I don't think we can conclude everything, but we need to make a clear step in the right direction. And in the super trial of at the end of, uh, uh, of March, I, I, I hope that all the points can go in the package, in the package solution. I hope that the uh, social conditionality can be part uh, together with the climate, of course. Okay, thank you, Paolo. We're running out of time now, um, but we do have time for some very important questions. For example, one from Paola or Paula. Um, how can we ensure a much needed gender approach to the trans transformation of our food systems? And this is really interesting, and I, and I, I wonder whether the CAP is really doing anything at all to, uh, to boost the, the very low numbers of female farmers and female farm owners um, that we actually have um, in, in Europe. Umberto. What is the CAP doing? Is the CAP doing anything to, to help women farmers? To be very honest, I don't feel really prepared to bring in this gender element on the CAP. I've been following it with these environmental lenses. You can say that the environment can also have a gender approach, but you would, uh, you would need to ask that uh, to someone more knowledgeable on the CAP details than myself, sorry. Okay, okay. Um, is any, I mean, does anyone else want to want to jump in here? And it doesn't necessarily have to be about what the cap is, uh, what the cap is doing. But I mean, do we have a gender Im imbalance? I mean, I think we do, given that I was looking at some Eurostat statistics yesterday, which said that only 30% of, of uh, farmers in Europe are, are women. So clearly, that is that is an imbalance. Um, Jonathan, I mean, what, what about things on the on the global perspective? Um, are, are there a lot more female farmers outside outside the EU proportionally than inside? Well, I was, I was thinking about Faustine's comment at the start about about being a you know on a a male a male panel and and also uh, if I can say to my other two panelists as well it, it doesn't help when it's always a a bald male panel as as well. Um, I, I think you know the issue that I would I would point out on uh, on this really is that a lot of the policy as it exists keeps structures the same. So you can have gender specific and gender directed policies, but a, a key requirement is structural change. And, and structural change itself is something that can foster uh, greater, gen, uh, greater gender equality and more access to females. There's not much of the budget, I mentioned not much spent on innovation, not much spent on transferable skills, the kind of skills that young people uh, want to, to acquire to come into the sector. It's not just that there's a, a lack of women in the sector, it's that we always see the agricultural sector aging in terms of its farm population as well. So to get dynamism, I think it's more about investment in human capitals, investment in transferable skills, and making sure that the way that those policies are constructed is, uh, is sensitive in terms of, of gender. Uh, there's a very general, general answer there, but I, I suspect that a lot of the uh, solutions lie in equalizing general policies rather than mandated specific ones. Okay, Faustine, do you think part of the problem could be that a lot of agricultural policy is made by men rather than women? Just a, just a theory, well, I, haven't chosen, I, was, I haven't necessarily found that out, but do you think that could no, be a problem? I, 
Indeed, we would have to study that. Uh, but um, yeah, I was actually uh, uh, going to bring that. Uh, we also need to look at the uh, agriculture you know, instance of, of power indeed. And uh, I wanted to ask, because I wasn't sure when was the last time, if there was a last time, uh, that there was a, a chair of Comagri who was a woman, because that's a question I had for myself. And if we look also at the balance of agriculture minister uh, sitting in the council, I not sure it's actually gender balance, but again, this is something that would have to be uh, uh, studied more. Yeah, I think I think from my from my limited knowledge, there there are far fewer female agriculture ministers um, than than male ones. Although you know that that being said, the the current one who's chairing the the council and of course Julia Kluckner before were were women. So there we go. That's 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 not an answer, but it's just a couple of points. Um, let me go to some other questions in the in the Q and A now before we before we finish. Um, just going to see yes what 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 else is is coming up here. We have one from the Canadian Canadian Embassy from Lynn Fortin. Thank you very much for your question to Umberto. While trade is not an objective in itself, um, is providing more options for consumers for nutritional price or simply pleasure a legitimate objective? Objective. What do you think? Uh, yes, it is. I mean, the will of consumers is indeed important and it underlies trade. But I would signal as something I said in the beginning, what do most Europeans want from food? And they seem to want uh, something that looks like healthy and healthy uh, links to naturalness, to natural food. So th that's where I see a big opportunity from including from the angle of innovation that we often associate with high tech, which of course has a very important role, but innovation also means bringing in nature-based solutions, agroecology, and linking these two approaches, the technological one with the natural one. That's where I see the most chances of success, including for imports that do feed this trend, at least within Europe, that we want something good for the environment, good for our health and good for nature. Okay, one, one final thing for you, Umberto. We've got another question here. Unfortunately, it's from someone who's anonymous, but it touches on what we were talking about earlier, and I, and I don't think I was completely satisfied with, with the responses I got, so I'll give it another bite. How will the EU make sure that the farm-to-fork strategy in the long run also applies to food production in countries outside the EU on which the EU depends? It's a really well-put question, I think. Okay, so let me try that one, which I think is an important one. The EU uh, only leads in one way, which is by example. We have seen that happen in climate change policy in the, in the past, where we were for long the lighthouse of the world, based on what? Well, our self-interest. We have understood that there's an advantage to reduce emissions and to tackle climate change. And in Europe, we still remain a relevant market with a reasonable size, and as a union, we are known for usually, well, we also do mistakes, of course, but we are good standard setters, I would say. So if you see that nowadays, first we have this impulse from our own policy, the Green Deal as such. If you link, let, let me just highlight on my field uh, of, uh, of competence, which is biodiversity, we will have this year, later on, on, on China, uh, a meeting of the Convention of Biological Diversity to set up a new deal for nature. And what did you do to lead? Well, the biodiversity strategy says what we will do anyway ourselves within the EU on protection, restoration, and all the rest related to biodiversity. And we hope this to influence others to move along. There's a commonality between targets in the biodiversity strategy and farm to fall strategy. And we also, there's also a UN food system summit coming. So there are many grounds out there. Also the link between the climate summit and nature-based solutions that the UK presidency wants to, 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 to bring in. So there are many chances for others that have understood themselves how sustainability is important, including in the food system, for me to believe that the world will have to move in this direction because, you know, there's no alternative. Okay, that's interesting. Um... Maybe we can turn to a slightly different topic just just to finish off with before I before I close things up, which I which I think is maybe quite a fun way to to end things. I mean, on the on the future of food. I mean, for me, I've, I've been thinking a lot more about when I go into the supermarket about what I'm buying because I'm spending much much more time cooking for myself. Given that all restaurants and cafes are, are closed here in Brussels, um, does anyone you know by putting up your hand want to want to talk about um, how 
this period of our lives might actually change the way that we think about food and how that could drive changes um, in, in, in consumer habits, maybe away from meat, away from alcohol, maybe, I don't, I don't know, or maybe towards those things as, as, comforting, as comforting foods. Um, Faustine, maybe, do you, have, do you have anything to add, add on this? Uh, yeah, well, briefly, uh, um, I mean, even before the, the pandemic started, actually, uh, I, myself, I was buying uh, uh, local and, uh, and organic. And uh, I just want to bring an anecdote here because, you know, often we, we feel quite far away from, from the farmers who produce the food that, that we eat. But when you eat local, you know, you have that links, which is quite important. And I remember once, uh, having bought some uh, um, uh, uh, cheese, actually. Um, and uh, we, we, we found it really good. And we sent a, a, an SMS because there was the, the number of the farmer on the cheese to the farmer who responded, uh, uh, you know, the following day saying, because we said that that was delicious and, and thanks a lot for your work, etc. cetera. And uh, he responded to us that, you know, he was very happy to hear that because, you know, he needed that to, 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 keep, to keep going. I think that connection is very important, actually. And, um, and, you know, when the pandemic started, uh, it started being difficult for me to actually buy uh, the local uh, uh, food I used to because all of a sudden, lots of people started to, to do it. Um, I was really optimistic and, uh, you know, I was hoping that this change in, in, in consumer patterns and trends would actually last, but I had my doubts about that. And unfortunately, I think that the picture is a bit more mixed than, 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 than what I would have thought at the beginning. And indeed things, I mean, I'm not going to say that they have gone back to, to, to normal, but some people might have changed and are buying more local, et cetera, but that's not necessarily true for everyone. And it's, it's a bit sad to see that these farmers who actually increased, you know, their production capacity, et cetera, during the pandemic and also hired more people, et cetera, then were completely forgotten when things started to, to, to settle again. So. Okay. As a final word, I, I'll, I'd like to bring Sean. Oh, sorry, sorry, Umberto, but I'd like to bring Sean. I'd like to bring Sean back in. Um, you're a sheep and beef farmer in um, the Roscommon County, yeah, so that's in the west of Ireland. Um, are you selling direct to, to consumers, and have you noticed any changes during the pandemic in the way that you're connecting with the people who are eating your your products, your meat? Uh, no, I'm not selling directly to the consumer. I sell to the processor who processes um, my product, and then. Uh, in turn sells it on to the retailer who, who who provides it to the consumer. So um, I have noticed in Ireland that there has been an increase in the amount of um, meat consumption, in particular the specific type of beef cuts, because people probably have more time, so they can put more effort and time into the, the cooking of those types of cuts. Um, so um, I think uh, this whole pandemic will probably mean that people's habits will will change and um, probably has resulted in a rebalancing of the whole uh, chain back to maybe consumers uh, cooking their own products and 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 um, experimenting maybe more with what they can do with the great food that's produced by farmers across Europe. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Umberto, I will give you the final final word if you still want to make a, make a comment and then that will be it because we've, over, we've gone over an hour now. So. Umberto, go for it. I'll do a very quick, quick one, which is a trend that I seem to identify coming from the youth and millennials related to diets. We see a lot of them going into alternative diets, more plant-based, vegan, vegetarian, and so forth. So my comment is actually meat-related. We see nowadays meat being under siege as, as if the ultimate culprit. But indeed, it, it depends on what meat you are referring to. Intensive livestock farming brings many problems to the environment, but we, you know, we do need the ecological role of herbivores out there in the extensive farming. So I'm convinced that a trend was there to shift diets towards more plant-based, which is good because we can't keep on ever increasing meat demand. The planet won't sustain it, but I hope that this regenerative grazing, regenerative agriculture can show that we need ecosystems back in farmland where animals also have a role and that can be pretty sustainable. So, voila. Okay, thank you, Umberto. Um, we have to wrap it up there. I really want to thank um, our amazing panelists, really interesting conversation. 
I think we could have spent an hour on each one, each one of the questions and each one of your responses. But anyway, it was, it was really good to speak to you. Thank you very much, Faustine, uh, Jonathan, Umberto, uh, Paolo, and Sean um, for being on our panel today. Um, and thanks to our audience um, for following us and for listening and sending such interesting questions. Um, I only managed to get to a few of them, but uh, you know, they've provided food for thought for us. Um, and you know, we'll be delving into more of these topics, as always, in our morning agriculture newsletter, which we, you know, which we produce every day of the week. Um, thank you as well to our partner, Bayer, for making this event possible. Um, and yeah, feel free to send us feedback um, at events at politico.eu. Um, we'll read all your, all your emails and get back to you. Um, ah, yes, of course, the poll. Someone's, point, someone's reminding me. Final thing, yes. OK, the results of our poll. What most needs to change in, in Europe's agriculture and food industry to reach the ambitions of the EU Green Deal? 194 people have answered. Uh, and 56% of them, the clear majority, say that it's clearer, co closer cooperation between the actors through the supply chain rather than um, scaling up the development of technology. Um, I suppose that includes innovation that we talked about today, which is at 35%, or simply allocating more subsidies to farmers at 9%. So there we go. Um, thank you so much. The, the, the takeaways, when we've touched on everything, we've touched on trade, we've touched on environment, we've talked about whether food security really is the, the main lesson to learn or what other lessons might, might you know, we might need to learn from the pandemic. At the end, we were talking about whether a change in consumer habits, um, you know, maybe away, away from meat or away from certain cuts of meat is just a, f a flash in the pan um, or whether that will really last. Um, we went into, uh, you know, a lot of detail on the common agricultural policy, on the farm to fork strategy and the different targets for agrochemicals that, that are set out in there. We talked about how the EU could um, lift, try to lift up the rest of the world um, to follow its example and lead by example as Umberto, Umberto said. Um, and yeah, I think we've, we've, we've touched on a huge number of issues. Uh, it's going to give me a lot of um, thinking to do and hopefully some reporting as well after this. So thank you so much to everybody and um, have a lovely rest of the day.